Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to tonight's Council on Foreign Relations meeting. I am Jim Lindsay, uh, Senior Vice President and Director of Studies here at the Council on Foreign Relations. I also want to uh, welcome everyone who is joining us via the wonders of the internet as we live stream tonight's uh, lively and timely discussion. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's guests. Uh, I think you're going to learn they are both terrific talents, uh, and I'm very proud to be their colleague. Uh, first, to my immediate right is Ambassador Robert Blackwell. He is the Henry A. Kissinger Senior Fellow for U.S. Foreign Policy. Now, Bob has had an illustrious career uh, in public service, having held numerous, and I will say distinguished, foreign policy posts over the years. I am, beg my pardon, Bob, not going to go through all of the posts <laughs> you had. Uh, let me just hit a couple of the highlights. Bob has served for or under five presidents. He was U.S. Ambassador to India from 2001 to 2003. Uh, he did multiple stints on the staff of the National Security Council including as Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategic Planning under George W. Bush. Uh, between his government stints, uh, Bob was on the faculty at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government for a dozen years. He wrote a lot. By my count, he has written, co-written, co-edited uh, 10 books, uh, one of them being uh, the best-selling book uh, with Graham Allison, Lee Kuan Yew, The Grand Master's Insights on China, the United States and the world. And uh, just this year, the Indian government honored Bob uh, with the 2016 Padma Bhushan Award for distinguished service of a high order. So congratulations, Bob. Uh, our other guest is Jennifer Harris. Uh, Jen is a senior fellow here uh, at the council. Uh, before joining the David Rockefeller Studies Program, uh, Jen served on the staff of the National Intelligence Council and on the policy planning staff of the US State Department. Uh, where she was a lead architect of Secretary Clinton's economic statecraft agenda. Uh, Jen is both a Truman uh, and a Rhodes Scholar, quite an accomplishment. Uh, and tonight, however, we're not here to sing their past praises. We're here to talk about the publication of their new, terrific new book, War by Other Means, Geoeconomics and Statecraft. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Bob and Jen. Congratulations, Bob. Congratulations, Jen, on the publication of the book. Thank you. I will note that the Weekly Standard uh, called it readable and lucid. Uh, and, Better than the alternative. Uh, well, it's, I take it. That's pretty good. And a reviewer in the Indian Express was so taken with the book that he urged Indian diplomats and strategists to read it because it was relevant to what they do. Let's begin with the basics. Uh, look at the subtitle of the book. Uh, it contains a word that many people either may not be familiar with or, or have heard in a variety of different contexts, uh, and that's the word geoeconomics. So I'm going to turn to you first, Bob. What do you mean by geoeconomics? Uh, well, that turned out to be a, a question that uh, Jen and I worked hard on uh, in the early stages of our research. If you, uh, to our surprise, look in the literature exhaustively, uh, you find uh, a constant use of the term without any definition and people, uh, scholars and public policy practitioners using the term without ever defining uh, what they think it is. So we thought hard about it and came up with the definition which we think distinguishes this particular discipline from uh, others, which is that geoeconomics is using economic tools for geopolitical purposes. So it's not using economic tools for economic purposes, although those are fine, uh, notable objectives. It's using these economic tools to advance a government, a nation's geopolitical interests. And the book is organized around that definition. And we look at which countries uh, are skillful at uh, using those instruments for geopolitical objectives and which ones are less apt. So geoeconomics is 
a subset of geopolitics rather than something uh, different from geopolitics? I would say it's parallel to geopolitics. Most, and maybe Jen would chime in, we'll see if we even agree, but uh, 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 if you look at geopolitics and you go back to the 19th century and Mackinder and all of that, uh, you discover that it has a very strong geographic uh, orientation uh, and a geographic orientation based on security. Okay. And this is a different notion, both because technology, of course, has erased many of those boundaries, but also the great strategists uh, uh, from Sun Tzu forward uh, don't usually talk about economics uh, as a means to uh, geopolitical objectives. And uh, without giving you the punchline, the United States, uh, for most of its history, understood the utility of these economic instruments for geopolitical purposes, from the Louisiana Purchase to uh, the Marshall Plan, both of which, of course, were dominated by geopolitical considerations, but uh, in more recent decades have uh, forgotten that historical <coughs> legacy. Did you want to jump in here, Jen? Sure. I think in, uh, in practice, a lot of people uh, know what geopolitics looks like when they see it. It's more or less the way in which states are struggling for control over territory, often by reference to a set of geographic factors, right? Population, military, including uh, certain economic factors. But uh, where w what we're really trying to describe is how states are pursuing those same aims, but rather than reaching for traditional diplomatic or military tools, they are reaching for a whole host of economic tools. And this can take the form of everything from trade and investment policies that are wielded more, again, in pursuit of certain geopolitical aims, or certain aspects of the cyber domain, uh, the way in which countries are So for are you, attacking. cyber is part of geoeconomics? Some of it, okay. some of it. Uh, certainly some, some uh, cyber attacks right. that have been state-sponsored, state uh, the goings-on in various nuclear facilities, we don't consider that within the realm of what we're talking about. But where we see states taking to cyber attacks against the banking sectors of other countries to vent a geopolitical grievance, like we saw in the early days of the Russia-Georgia conflict in 2008, where some of Russia's opening shots were cyber attacks aimed at the Georgian banking sector. That is very much within the realm of what we're looking at. Okay. I take it from your opening remarks, Bob, that you came to the conclusion that some states are good at geoeconomics and some states aren't. Who's really good at it? Uh, China. You'd have to start with China. Uh, uh, and I as we discuss in the book at some length, this isn't a perfect uh, uh, scorecard. China doesn't always do it well. But for two decades or so, as China became more powerful, uh, they have begun, begun quite systematically to use incentives, uh, interest-free loans, and disincentives, coercive measures, to affect the, the geopolitical positions of other nations. Lee Kuan Yew put it like this, uh, which is vivid. He said, the Chinese say publicly, all states are equal. But when we do something that they don't like, they say, have you noticed the size of our market? And know your place. Don't offend 1.2 billion Chinese. So they calibrate this. If Jap Japan does something geopolitically they don't like, Japanese imports of automobiles to China diminish. If the Philippines don't uh, act in ways in the South China Sea that uh, Beijing doesn't like, Philippine fruits and vegetables rot on the, uh, on the docks of Chinese ports and so forth. So I think they, with this enormous uh, wealth they now have uh, to use, have been uh, the most uh, skillful, 
not perfect, but skillful in reminding uh, other countries that there is an economic price to pay for geopolitical behavior that China doesn't like. So Jen, who else makes the list of, of countries that are good at geoeconomics? Right. Uh, certainly, as Bob mentioned, China tops that list, uh, but China's not alone. Uh, you know, Russia's pipeline politics, I'm sure, is well known to all of you, but we also see Russia slapping very questionable sanctions on Ukrainian chocolates that happened to be owned by Petro Poroshenko uh, months, in fact, before we saw protesters really fill the, the Maidan Square. And, uh, we also see uh, this, you know, the Gulf countries in 2015 alone spend some $12 billion uh, in the contest of, for, for favor with the new Egypt. Uh, just what last week we saw the Saudis uh, threaten to dump U.S. Treasury bills if, in fact, Congress goes through with pinning liability for 9-11 on the Saudis. Uh, so certainly, uh, you know, China is a leading practitioner, but by no means all there is. Uh, there's, there's ample examples from, from India, Brazil on through as well. Okay, two words I haven't heard. United States. So is that because the United States is just mediocre at the practice of geoeconomics, or is it bad at it? Uh, well, I think it's really a forgotten art, a lost art in American statecraft. Uh, in digging back through the history, what actually was some of my favorite uh, research for the book, as someone who ran from history in, in grad school and college, it's sort of cosmic irony that this would prove to be some of the most uh, interesting anecdote filled pieces of, uh, of the project. But uh, you really see for the f about the first 200 years of American history, uh, you know, US leaders quite comfortable flexing U.S. economic muscle in pursuit of explicitly geopolitical aims. Uh, you know, there, there certainly were the, you know, the, the high water monks are, are pretty well known to all of us, the Marshall Plan. Mm -hmm. uh, but even you know, things like the Louisiana Purchase, uh, as much as Jefferson liked a good deal, his main motivation was keeping the French from gaining a foothold uh, in, in, on the American continent and potentially setting a pretty young and exhausted uh, U.S. Army up for a confrontation with Napoleon's troops that we probably wouldn't win. Uh, even you know, in some of, the, some of the, the pieces that are in some ways familiar, but yet not uh, of uh, U.S. geoeconomic statecraft, when lease comes to mind. Uh, Churchill once called this a, a declaration of economic war, uh, except it was one that he felt was aimed as much at Britain <laughs> as uh, Berlin, and he wasn't unfounded in this. Uh, it, you know, the terms of what was really about $660 billion worth of American aid that we were lending to our allies in World War II uh, came at some cost. We were unilaterally controlling the level of uh, British gold and uh, you know, uh, unilaterally controlling British exports and seeking to rewrite the terms of the post-war order with U.S. interests at the center. And none of this was lost on the British. I think a lot of people... Could I just chime in one more since the British uh, <laughs> are... Uh, uh, are uh, uh, at issue here, uh, two more, one during uh, the American Civil War when the British were tempted to be sympathetic to the Confederacy because of their dependence on southern cotton. The government, the U.S. government, the Lincoln government told them that if they wished to have all of their assets in the United States expropriated, this would be a good way to do it. And then, of course, Suez comes to mind, in which the United States, the Eisenhower administration, uh, uh, so appalled by the British-French invasion of Suez, threatened basically to destroy the British pound if they proceeded. And that was uh, the end of the intervention, that the British uh, were, uh, it wasn't Eisenhower uh, and Dallas's general opposition to this, it was that Harold Macmillan, uh, who was uh, uh, at number 11, he was the finance minister uh, to Anthony Eden, said uh, they can do it and they'll do it. And Eisenhower would have done it because Ben-Gurion lied to him in writing about the Israeli involvement in this. So um, uh, we used to know how to do it. And none of these are things, right, that we could imagine our, our friends in the administration, I've, on either side of the aisle, uh, Republican or Democrat, really contemplating with any seriousness today. But I would imagine a lot of people hearing this story would say, well, wait a second, the United States resorts to financial sanctions, uh, trade sanctions, 
uh, quite regularly. They were used to try to bring the Iranians to the negotiating table. We uh, applied them against Russia in the wake of the Russian seizure of Crimea. So do those not count as uh, geoeconomics, or is it geoeconomics done badly? So we try to be pretty right. upfront in the book that we see sanctions as kind of the exception that proves the rule. Uh, right now, the Obama administration has about 30 sanctions programs in place, which is more than any other uh, president in history, I think more than several combined. Uh, and it's not just a story about innovation in, in quantity. This is, these are really sanctions that are different in kind. Uh, but even as you have seen uh, you know, a real sort of progress made in the sanctions realm, you don't see it uh, encased within a, a broader diplomatic strategy that, uh, for instance, managed to get the French to turn off military shipments to Russia um, sooner than the seven months of long, hard conversations that, that it took, or uh, you know, the conversations within uh, NATO about what are the proper responsibilities and uh, shared understandings are around what is owed to uh, military allies in, when, when it comes to economic coercion. What about something like uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership? There's been a lot of talk about TPP not being solely about trade, but about trying to set the geopolitical order in East Asia. Uh, is this an indication of geoeconomics getting back on the U.S. agenda, or you think it's more symbolism than, than well, reality? Well, it, it isn't symbolism, but it's a matter of sequence, and we go into the book in some detail. Um, our analysis, uh, and there's lots of documentation available uh, which supports this, is that we do not negotiate trade agreements with geopolitical objectives in mind. We simply don't. Uh, these are trade agreements negotiated by our experts on trade, which of course are seeking to reinforce U.S. national interests and make America wealthier and open up the global economy and so forth. But they are negotiated solely on trade criteria. After they are agreed, and when administrations have to sell these agreements to the U.S. Congress, they suddenly recognize and assert their geopolitical importance. Uh, Ash Carter uh, says that the, the uh, TPP is worth one aircraft carrier. Okay. Uh, uh, Colin Powell made similar comments about NAFTA. These are all made after the fact when we're trying to persuade the Congress, administrations are trying to persuade the Congress to, um, to approve them. To put it differently, if you did uh, imagine that there should be geopolitical objectives in the TPP, in the agreement, of course, you would address Chinese coercive pressure on the nations of Asia. Of course you would have that in the agreement because it's persistent uh, and uh, it's been relatively effective in many cases. There's not a word about that. In, and uh, what it demonstrates, at least in our view, is uh, that these able, dedicated trade people uh, don't consider that uh, as an important element in their negotiation, and there's no one there who uh, makes that case. And then we do, just to finish, we look at the history of the bureaucratic politics of this and the story which Jan, who was in, uh, as our chairman said, the Clinton administration, or, or the uh, uh, Obama administration for Hillary Clinton, working at the State Department, uh, the bureaucratic politics over these decades has uh, reduced the role of the State Department in these trade negotiations, uh, uh, partly in the, at the insistence of the Congress. So they're basically far at the margin of this today. So, so negotiate them with no geoeconomic content and sell them with a geoeconomic, geopolitical argument is the history of these agreements. So, Jen, I take it that the uh, clock is running down on the administration you worked in. Uh, next January, we're going to get a new president, leaving aside whoever was going to win the race. From your vantage point, 
what should the next administration do if it were serious about geoeconomics? What would that look like? Uh, so Bob and I sketch out a 20-point uh, prescription agenda in, in the uh, final chapters of the book, which I will not recount right now, <laughs> in part because I, I would hope that all of you agree with us, but reasonable minds can and should and will differ on, on you know, the, the particular uh, tax to take, and a lot of this is going to be fact-bound. Uh, our project is really less to argue a case for what to think about these geoeconomic tools and more uh, to lay out a framework for how to think about them. And so uh, to me, uh, any prescriptive agenda would have, whatever the, the, the particulars of it, would have four basic ingredients. Uh, one, I think you do need a, a common reference point, a common conceptual framework with a clear definition that allows us to be clear with ourselves bureaucratically uh, and clear with our allies. In order to call out geoeconomic coercion uh, when it's happening to our allies in Asia, we need to know what it looks like. Uh, and uh, so I think that's, that's point one. Uh, point two, it would be to really begin to work this into the bloodstream of some of our alliances. Uh, our, our relationship with Europe is a great example. Uh, you know, NATO is the closest military uh, alliance probably the modern world has ever known, and yet we remain one of four or five countries that has not moved beyond very basic, most favored nation status uh, with the EU in, in trade terms. We, we lack any economic counterpart for what NATO represents on the security side, even as it's very clear that when Russia wants to, uh, you know, flex geopolitical muscle, it is reaching for these economic tools, as, we've, uh, as it has been put on pretty clear display in Ukraine. Uh, so I would uh, want to see us begin to prioritize uh, you know, certain geoeconomic responses within some of uh, our closest uh, sort of security relationships. Third, resources. Uh, you know, this is in part a dollars and, and this is part of dollars and cents issue. Uh, Seven hundred and thirteen million dollars. Uh, one of my uh, favorite numbers that I've I've been quoting a lot these days. Uh, Monday through Wednesday in Afghanistan. And uh, so when it comes to arguing f you know, for what we could do for Ukraine right. in terms of giving that country a viable economic foundation or uh, how we might begin to steal our allies in Asia against the kind of geoeconomic coercion that Bob is talking about, our entire aid envelope for Ukraine last year, I believe, was about $340 million, less than half of Monday through Wednesday in Afghanistan. Uh, so it is, it is in part a dollars and cents issue, but it's also uh, about how this money is authorized. Uh, when I was uh, in the uh, State Department, we actually put out a pretty good uh, geoeconomic theory of the case uh, in the President's first, and I believe, only response to the Arab Spring. His May 2011 address, which really took full on uh, the, the, the revolutions across the Middle East, forwarded a pretty economic theory of the case. It was loan guarantees. It was a billion dollar debt swap for Egypt. It was a set of enterprise funds for Tunisia and Egypt that were modeled after uh, what we had done pretty successfully after the Soviet Union. Three years later, when I left the State Department, those enterprise funds had yet to cut their first check. We were still arguing with ourselves as an administration about how to spend this billion dollar uh, debt swap. And even as our Egyptian counterparts, in terms of who we're negotiating with, had since begun to revolve and, and you know, events basically just outpaced us. So we, you know, we need the ability and the wherewithal from Congress to be able to move a little bit more quickly in how we spend this money, separate and apart from how much money we have to spend. Bob, anything you want to add to that in terms of guidance well, to the next administration? I guess, well, uh, they're not, uh, they're not calling uh, me uh, all that often <laughs> to ask, but um, I just make one point, uh, which Jen and I emphasize in the book, uh, which is that uh, beginning to use these economic tools for geopolitical purposes is not a replacement for American military might, uh, which has to uh, remain the most stabilizing force in world order, in my opinion. However, what we do argue is that uh, we've become too instinctively dependent on that instrument. And uh, one uh, example of that, and I don't know if there's anybody here uh, who works on the Hill or uh, is watching who works on the Hill, but have a look at what the hearings are on the Hill. 
and try to find a hearing that looks at economic issues in the Foreign Relations Committee. They look at mili almost solely security questions. This is not the, to argue, of course, they shouldn't be looking at security questions, but they don't think of economic means worth exploring in public hearings to accomplish some of our uh, 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 strategic objectives in the Middle East other than, as you said, Chairman, sanctions. We understand what sanctions do. We're very good at it in many ways. But beyond sanctions, uh, they simply don't think in that way. And what you mentioned the next administration, what we would like uh, the next administration to do is address this uh, uh, American at asset, we have the biggest economy in the world, with this enormous economic power, uh, address this asset systematically and think internally, how do they organize themselves that in NSC meetings, which we've all been in up here, that it actually comes up? Because usually the people who might address that uh, aren't in the room, aren't in the room. So uh, that's our uh, dream, I guess is the word. Okay. Well, fair enough. I, what I want to do now is bring our members into the conversation. Let me remind everybody that uh, this meeting is on the record. Uh, I will also ask you to wait for the microphone and speak directly into it. Uh, I would also ask that you please stand, state your name uh, in affiliation. And if people would uh, keep their questions concise so we can get everybody uh, a chance to talk uh, on this provocative topic. We'll do that. Let's start over here. And Sam is going to come up with a microphone right behind you. Oh, you're over here. Okay. <laughs> Stuck up on me. Hi. John Sullivan with uh, George Mason University, formerly with the Center for International Private Enterprise. Do you include U.S. foreign assistance in your range of instruments that you look at? Uh, it would seem to me logical to do it. Not that U.S. foreign assistance is often used strategically, but it could be. Uh, yes, we do, uh, both economic and military. Military is among the least interesting of the bunch, only there because money is fungible. So military assistance that we are giving is freeing up budget space for the Egyptians or others that they put to other ends. Uh, and yeah, I think we do need to have a real conversation about uh, the use of economic assistance as a foreign policy tool and what constitutes an acceptable versus unacceptable use of uh, you know, USAID. Uh, we also need to have a conversation about how the world has changed and uh, what new tools uh, in the assistance space we should be considering. I, for one, would like to see the U.S. begin to look at instruments that uh, would allow for things like OPEC to take equity positions in addition to debt. That is a thing that's pretty routine and, and it happens as a regular course uh, across our, our European counterparts, not to mention the likes of what uh, the Chinese state-led policy banks are, are throwing out at, you know, they're going out strategies across Latin America and Africa. Can I just chime in uh, and say, uh, and Jen mentioned Egypt earlier, I, I like this question because it allows me to give you this, this one, which is not rhetorical. So, what would you think will have the biggest influence on the future of the Middle East? The war in Yemen or the future of the Egyptian economy? And I think most of us would know the answer to that. And yet, we do pitifully little uh, on the future of the Egyptian economy. Now, this isn't to suggest that economies are our responsibility or uh, that we, we can fix it, but imagine a NSC meeting in which the subject was, how can we use American economic tools comprehensively to bolster the economic future of Egypt? And um, I posit that that uh, economic future will be more decisive regarding American vital national interests than most of what preoccupies uh, the administration and its predecessors and the media. Let's go over to Professor Hollifield. I'm Jim Hollifield uh, this year at the Wilson Center, normally uh, at the Tower Center in SMU, in Dallas. 
Um, how do you take into account sort of conventional macroeconomic policy, exchange rate policy, interest rate policy? I mean, the U.S. does control the world's uh, reserve currency. So how do you think about Bretton Woods? And secondly, uh, if we have stopped doing this, I think we, we did it certainly in the 50s and 60s. Stop doing this. Uh, why, why did we stop doing it? I think the question, I'm going to turn this one over to Jen about, uh, because it's, uh, I think it's a terrific question. Uh, the back half, we really have struggled a lot with about, we think we know what happened. Why did it happen? And we got into this a little bit on the trade side, saying that the Congress and successive administrations are basically took any strategic perspective out of the trade negotiations through bureaucratic politics by having a trade representative taking it out of the State Department and so forth. But over to Jen. It was almost overdetermined. Uh, so we, we traced this story about when the U.S. Sort of abandoned uh, you know, Jew economics as a first resort and why to about the end of the Cold War around Vietnam. A couple things were going on at that time, right? Uh, one, there are there's some bureaucratic politics, as Bob mentioned, the USTR being pulled out of the State Department and, and given its own independent mandate. It's also the first generation of economic insecurity the country had experienced since the Great Depression. It was no longer clear that we had economic carrots to be spinning about on our geopolitical agendas. It, uh, it was also kind of the rise of the multinational corporation, complete with a lobbying presence here in, uh, in Washington. That began to change some of the discourse in Congress, and you see that uh, you know, line up very well in, in terms of the congressional record. Uh, but to be a little provocative, uh, I think one, one theory about uh, a lesser appreciated factor uh, has more to do actually with what's going on in the discipline of economics than foreign policy. Namely, it was the you know, sort of right the moment where Keynes was going out of fashion and Milton Friedman was coming into fashion. And uh, we happened to be up against a, an adversary in the Soviet Union who made no particular love of markets and uh, had no particular use for trade. And so every win for the United States in terms of uh, freeing trade and liberalizing markets was also a win for us in geopolitical terms. And uh, so perhaps it was no accident, actually, that you saw this happy convergence between the U.S.'s geopolitical interests and the, the neoliberal uh, economic orthodoxy that we began seeing kind of rise into or, uh, its own. Uh, but and it worked pretty well for a while. I think in, in the early years after the Cold War, we faced no great adversary that required us to rethink whether this happy alignment still exists. But now we're up against uh, you know, countries like China and Russia that once again, appear to have no particular distinctions between state and market and are pretty comfortable exercising power in economic terms. And I think maybe it's time to ask whether this happy alignment of our, of our security and our economic uh, sort of orthodoxies still exists. Avis. Yeah. Eric will bring you a microphone. Um, Avis Bolin, retired Foreign Service officer, former sometime colleague of Robert's. <laughs> um, I just, I had a, um, a few skeptical thoughts in uh, Good. reaction to, to what you said, and also a question. Um, the, the first point, I think, Jen, you, you already answered. I, I was going to say that it's, it's so much in our ideology about free markets and <coughs> non-interference, and I would also add another point, that the, the U.S. government has a lot less control over the U.S. economy than <laughs> a country like China does <laughs> over its economy. So. It, it just wasn't in our thinking, and not just since Milton Friedman. I mean, um, you know, we've been pushing free trade since the Marshall Plan, as you as you mentioned. So, um, it, it's it. I really question whether we're, you know, what's the word? Ideologically set up mm -hmm. set up to um, to to do this, or 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 materially set up to do it. The second point is the balance of our interests. You mentioned the example of the French not being willing to give up selling the boats to Russia. Well, I mean, come on, that was tiresome. The French are always tiresome, <laughs> as we know. But, you know, they're a very important ally. We're going to unleash the full power of the United States economy to, to achieve this. I mean, I, I think there, there is always a balance of interests. And we, 
have a lot of interests around the world which are going to really preclude this. Third point is, I think. Well, I, 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 if I may, sorry. can I hold you there so I can let them have a chance to answer? We have a lot of questions in the audience I want to get could, to. Could I just mention that I think USAID has always mm -hmm. been a political instrument, and I saw it in the Sweet American Union. Thank okay. you. Uh, it, nice to see you. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Avis is one of the premier experts on how tiresome the French can be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> day by day by day, uh, enormous patience and skill on her part. Um, we don't suggest in the book that these instruments be used crudely in every case. But what we do say is uh, that administrations in the kinds of meetings that you used to routi routinely go to when you were here in policy positions is that they be at least raised to see if they have potential. So uh, we don't want to hit an ant with a uh, sledgehammer, but uh, we want to use these economic instruments the way we routinely, routinely use security coercion or at least imploration. So uh, 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 that's that. But the second is uh, more broadly, um, we used to and the, have a chapter in the book on the history of uh, American use of this. We used to do this with the people in the room, uh, the counterparts of the current cabinet members, who just as a matter of course thought this way. And uh, among, uh, and I won't mention names, names here, but the, among those who resist uh, our policy prescriptions are former secretaries of the treasury. Because, as those of us who've worked in government know, they tend to think of their business as too important for foreign policy considerations. Or the trade rep, I'm not speaking now about any particular one of them, who tend to think, and the Congress in particular tends to say, oh, I know what these people at the State Department are thinking. They want to trade away American jobs for geopolitical purposes. And so we used to know how to do this. It wasn't questioned that this were, these were effective tools. Sometimes they could use, be used badly, but that they were available. Um, and uh, that's, at least in our experience, which covers certainly the period since the end of the Cold War, uh, not the case. I'll give you one other uh, example, which you'll be, Avis, very familiar with. What's uh, the primary geopolitical action, uh, successful action, uh, in the 1990s? It's Helmut Kohl going to Russia and writing a check for German unification. That what better example of the use of an economic instrument to pay for the departure of the Red Army from East Germany and for the apartments that were built for them and the, a beautiful, beautiful example. Meanwhile, we were doing, trying to do enterprise funds for, uh, I was in the administration in the White House, for uh, uh, Eastern European transformation and we had no money. It's basically yes, we had no money. So we used to know how to do it, and we hope we'll learn how to do it again. Mr. Paris. Uh, Jonathan Paris, former Middle East fellow here, and uh, my former Middle East fellow, and uh, uh, currently a London-based analyst. Uh, just quickly on Egypt, of course the Egyptian economy is important, but it would be nice if we could help them keep their planes from falling out of the sky. Uh, that really impacts on their tourism. But my question is on China. China seems to have a good, uh, good deal going in Africa, for instance. They get a military base in Djibouti when they put in $12 billion of infrastructure in Ethiopia and Djibouti. And what do we get stuck with? We get stuck with doing all this counterterrorism against Boko Haram and Mali. So, you know, maybe the problem is they're getting a free ride on the counterterrorism, and, uh, and they get to get these chits. Uh, you know, building ports, and then they get a whole bunch of security uh, bene be benefits from all their infrastructure. Thank, 
Jan leaves for China tonight, so maybe <laughs> she should speak to that. Oh, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and I think you're beginning to see strands of this bubble up in the context of the US general election. Uh, it's, it's not too dissimilar from some of the noises that uh, Donald Trump certainly has made in questioning whether our allies are free riding. Uh, and uh, China has been masterful in its ability to parlay either the present reality of its economic power or the projections of future growth, uh, which probably matter just as much, into its geopolitical throw weight. And uh, so we could not agree more. I think this is a, you know, written as a project to try to get, you know, force uh, Washington to begin to wake up and confront what are not easy questions. Absolutely. The, these tools are, again, not to be used lightly, nor are they without controversy or costs. And we try to be quite clear about that. The problem is, is not that they cost something. Of course they cost something. But so, too, do every other form of statecraft, especially our military options. And I, I'd say I just think it's a, a good question about the Chinese in Africa. Uh, they use the construction of soccer stadiums as a geopolitical instrument. Uh, and if you, I think they're now, they built over 30 of them. And they are coincidentally in proximity to the home villages of the president of the country. So this is pretty micro, but exactly what you say. Uh, now they can make mistakes, they can overdo it or so forth, but look, look at the, which we do in the book, the connection between Chinese economic assistance to Africa and African votes at the UN on issues we care about. And or recognition most, of Taiwan. Or, yes, so, uh, or recognition of Taiwan, uh, where there's a direct correlation. So that, using assistance for their geopolitical goals, is, uh, is routine for them. Go to the back of the room. Uh, yes, hi, thank you. The name is Mercedes Fitchett with the Department of Defense. Back in 2003, after the Iraq invasion, where we were building the whole coalition effort, we actually used the over $18 billion in U.S. reconstruction projects as, uh, as a stick and a carrot for increasing the number of countries. And, and I recall there was a huge battle with France in terms of them being able to bid on contracts if they weren't part of the coalition. But did you all happen to take a look at what we did with that, with that tool in, in terms of growing the coalition in your book as a case study? Yeah. I, I was uh, the presidential envoy to Iraq when you were, when you were working those, which is, doesn't entirely explain our failure there, but is a major <laughs> part of it. Um, uh, let me uh, uh, make this distinction. Um, and you were involved in it, so you'll have much more details and maybe a, a definitive thought different from mine. When we were, and I was the White House, we were working our way through this. Um, we didn't think of those uh, reconstruction efforts. First of all, of course, total chaos, as you know, and, um, and uh, very little systematic thinking of any kind in any case. But insofar as we did think about it, we did not think about the long-term future of Iraq and how we might spend this money. Most of the recommendations that came in that we spent money in Iraq were from our military commanders who were trying, and of course it was important that they try, to stabilize wherever they were, uh, in the western desert, up north, and in the south near Basra. So, we didn't think about it in the kind of geoeconomic terms that uh, Jen and I uh, discuss in the book. Secondly, now uh, I will uh, 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 display a prejudice. Our geoeconomic thinking was infected by the virus of one man and woman, one vote, and quote, election objectives in both Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. And we became uh, mesmerized by these uh, election processes uh, at the expense of geoeconomic thinking. So summing up, we spent our money, that money, very badly in obviously in both those countries. 
uh, very badly. Uh, and I think one of the reasons was that we didn't, as Jen was urging and as we urge in the book, we didn't think of these as tools beyond the either pure development in a micro area or tools beyond bringing these people uh, to democracy, which, as we've seen, would have meant, since it failed, of course, completely, would have meant changing their entire culture and uh, political sociology. Uh, so uh, we didn't. Just, just one postscript of optimism <laughs> on that happy note, which is that uh, it, it's also true, though, that uh, we find that a lot of US military leaders are some of the most powerful surrogates and champions for exactly the argument that we're pushing. Uh, as we describe in the book, when I was in the early tough stages of thinking through Secretary Clinton's economic statecraft agenda, uh, I sat down with Admiral Mike Mullen and sort of heard him riff on, on some of this. And he gave more powerful expression to some of these uh, realities than anybody I had met before or since. He said, you know what, compare the man hours, woman hours we, the US military, have spent thinking through the size and composition of the Afghan National Security Forces to the man, woman hours we have spent thinking through a, a viable economic blueprint for that country's future. Right? Uh, and and uh, until we get that balance uh, closer to where it should be, I think we should expect to you know, continue paying for it and influence blood and treasure. Right, and Bob Gates, is, as you know, in his book and in his public speeches, uh, urges uh, 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 much more funds for the State Department uh, for essentially geoeconomic objectives. And so Leon Panetta did the same, and Ash Carter does the same, uh, uh, so far essentially to deaf ears in the Congress. Okay, we have time for one more question. Uh, before I take it, I want to remind everybody in the room this conversation has been on the record. I will also let people know that uh, copies of uh, Bob and Jen's book are available for sale at the back of the room. Those joining us on the internet. So lock the doors. You can always go on Amazon.com and other uh, e-retailers. With that said, sir, you have the last question. Thanks very much. Karan Bhatia with General Electric. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on a thesis that I think may be a corollary to what you're talking about, which is that the intentions, the ultimate objectives of a number of these other countries you referred to are in fact more economic in their core. So you look at One Belt, One Road, for instance, in China, or you look at uh, the position that a number of European countries have taken on sanctions. At the end of the day, you, you sort of look at those and you say, yeah, there's a core, strong economic element to it, advancing their economic interests. Whereas in the United States, we tend not to think about foreign policy in those kinds of terms. Would you agree with that? Is that, is that a notion that sort of uh, sits well alongside the thesis of your book? How do you see that, that idea? Well, I think that's that. General I'm sorry? But it's another question. I think we'll have to hold that for another meeting. I'm going to give Bob and Jen an opportunity to wrap up. And one, then... one belt, one road. Uh, uh, well, we don't know for sure since the Chinese government systematically lies about its strategic objectives, as we know. So we don't know for sure. But uh, I do think it has a strong economic core. But I think at its base, it's geopolitical. That is to say, if you look at the behavior in the last 20 years, they systematically build up in uh, dependencies which they use for their geopolitical purposes. And they do it again and again and again, and they remind people of these dependencies, the nations, when it matters. So, uh, so it's both. So it's both. But I think if you believe it's only which is what the Chinese, of course, say, which is one belt, one road, is only f for the benefit of the people of Asia, period. Uh, well, it has that dimension if it produces wealth and jobs and so forth. But I can tell you, I spend quite a bit of time in Central Asia, and uh, they, the people in Central Asia do not take at face value that there are no geopolitical Chinese objectives in this, in this policy. Any final word, Jen? 
so I think uh, you're kind of, you're getting to one of what was I think the hardest questions for us in the book, which is how do you know it when you see it? Countries rarely, sometimes they do helpfully signpost pretty explicitly, like the Saudis did uh, last week, or as the Chinese have done in explicitly conditioning certain investments by sovereign wealth funds on. Costa Rica's disavowal of Taiwan. There are pretty smoking gun cases, but more often, and usually in the cases where it's most effective, it's much more the stuff of correlation than direct causation. Uh, and uh, so, it, but it's also the case that just because there is some economic, um, you know, presence of economic rationale doesn't negate also the presence of geopolitical rationale. You know, all the better if there are two furs and three furs, I think, for the Chinese. But there are certain cases where, uh, you know, deals just don't make economic sense, and yet they happen anyway. And even in some of the IPOs that Chinese state-owned enterprises have, have come into you know, New York and, and listed on our stock exchanges, when you actually go through and read the security filings, I've done that. <laughs> not not the, the, you know, the most fun weekend I've ever spent, but uh, they're very upfront about the fact that, that these are companies that are owned by the Chinese government, that uh, there are certain objectives that are political that will occasionally trump. It's all kind of their black and white uh, when you, you sort of know what you're looking for. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that there, there are certain cases where you are going to just have to, you know, initiate some kind of a smell test, but the, the, just the sheer presence of economic motivation doesn't negate, uh, you know, the, the co-presence of uh, geopolitical rationale. Can, can I, I just wanted to also... Oh, um, I, I, will, I will give the ambassador... Yeah. I'll, well, I'll well, give no, you the no, final... Just one last one, uh, which we can... Another good example from China, which is in this category Jen was mentioning. Notice uh, the eerie coincidence that in the, uh, in the preliminaries to the visit of a Chinese president to the United States uh, for a summit with our president, notice the eerie coincidence of major Chinese purchases of Boeing aircraft. Uh, uh, they just do this routinely, and it's not just Boeing, it's Brazilian aircraft. We go into lots of examples. And I can assure you that in, our, in the deliberations of our highest councils of government, these sorts of notions, and of course the private sector for us, so it's not completely analogous, but just thinking through what do we, what economic instruments do we have in order to deal with the rise of Chinese power or to deal with uh, China, uh, sorry, Russia and their use of coercive pipeline politics, or to help foster our national interests in the Middle East, uh, what are they? And they just don't come up in the conversation. That is going to have to be the final word on a very complex, timely, and deep subject. However, the good news for everybody in the room uh, is that you can talk to Jen and Bob uh, as we wrap up. And of course, all of you are more than welcome and encouraged to buy a copy of War by Other Means. So please join me in uh, thanking Bob and Jen for a stimulating conversation. <laughs>